I want to start by thanking you, Maha, for being here with us today. Um, of course, everybody's um, here to hear what you have to say about uh, personal branding. And I'll have you know, we've had more than 300 registrations for this webinar. So uh, I'm so excited about the content you're going to share with us. Maha, for those of you do who don't know, is the Chief Value Officer for Gary Vaynerchuk and Executive Vice President of Business Development at VaynerX. She has more than 28 years of experience in uh, international communications. She has worked for global corporate giants, tech startups, governments, high net worth individuals, you name it. And just to drop a few names here and there from her career, um, you know, she had a comms for Google and MENA. She worked for, she launched Netflix in MENA. She launched uh, Weber Shandwick, Promo 7 Weber Shandwick in MENA as well, based out of Egypt. So a lot to talk about. She's going to talk about her career uh, trajectory as well. And she also has her own uh, podcast, Savvy Talk. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Maha. I just want to say, um, whenever you have questions, please don't shy away. Start sending them through uh, using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. And then we'll attend to these uh, towards the end. So Maha, over to you after your presentation. We'll get to my uh, chat and we'll leave like 15 minutes or so for questions at the end. Yeah, thank you, Summer. First of all, thanks you guys for joining. I'm so excited to talk to everyone today. It's, um, it's really good to, to come on here and talk about building your personal brand. And so I really, I'm gonna spend a few minutes just sharing some context up front and then we're gonna have a discussion and then really allow you guys to ask questions. Cause for me, that's the most value is like, what are the things that you guys really care about and wanna know? So just wanted to say kind of hello up front. Um, just to give you a little bit of context about me, I know she did a little bit of an introduction. So Summer, you can go to the one about kind of my career and storytelling. So I am American Egyptian. I'm born and raised in Minnesota, which is where I am right now. Um, I, I am Egyptian and uh, I worked for Nagib Zawiris for many years. So I worked with Nagib in Egypt so with Eroscom Telecom launching mobile networks, um, did a lot of communications and, and work for him, ended up uh, helping on the IPO and helping an acquisition of Telesel. So launching a lot of mobile networks with him. And then uh, really said, I really wanna go back and go to, back into communications because I was doing a lot of kind of M&A work with Nagib and really wanted to focus on storytelling. And so we said, what's what PR agency is not in the Middle East yet? And so we're like, Weber Shandwick's not here. And I used to work for Weber Shandwick here in the States. So basically knocked on the door and said, really, we really want to build Weber Shandwick in the Middle East. Approached literally like by cold calling the CEO of Weber Shandwick in New York and telling him, we really, we really think you should be in the Middle East and this is a region you should pay attention to. And so they listened and we brought them in. And so Promo Several Weber Shandwick was born. And then recently they changed their, their branding back to just Weber Shandwick globally. And then I was like tired of making money for other people, decided to start my own communications consulting company. And I really didn't want to be doing kind of um, retail PR and working as a large agency. So just a small consulting firm that would focus on storytelling and reputation management. So I wanted it to kind of be my own company with my own kind of DNA and culture. And then Google said, why don't you come work for us and do communications and, and help us in the region. And they had just had a handful of employees and were really you know, new into the market and kind of growing and really wanted to kind of have uh, you know, make information and story like communications through the internet more possible and kind of putting more content online, spent a good portion of time at Google, then went back to my company, opened up in Dubai and served all the brands that you see listed there. You know, Kareem worked with Kareem during they had that data breach that happened. If you guys remember that, those of you who are in Dubai and know the story um, and then worked with Netflix, obviously helped launch Deezer, which was the competitor to Spotify. And then now I work for Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V. So Gary was my client last year. And now I work uh, with him and the Vayner Media family and the Vayner X family. We can talk more about that later. Um, but really what I'm here to do and one of the things that, you know, when Gary and I talked a lot about my title and what I'm going to be doing and I do his, you know, communications with him and help with his personal brand, but also help the company in terms of business development. It's like, I really want to 
be adding value to the company and adding value to the organization. And so when, and you guys may have seen, I wrote this article that was just published last week in Entrepreneur Magazine about the value factor. Like why should you think about adding value to other people? And when you're thinking about your personal brand, you should always be thinking about the value quotient. Like what is it that you're doing that's adding value to your audience? How can I help add value to you guys who are spending an hour out of your day with me today to walk away from this session with something interesting that you didn't know before or a new um, a, a piece of information that you can walk away with and start to implement to build your brand. So in my whole DNA and everything that I kind of stand for, it's like, how can I add value and how can I help you guys? So hopefully today is just the start of a conversation on where you want to go with your personal brand and, and, and you should think about where you can go to add value next. So what I really want you guys to walk away from, from today is that everybody has the power to build a powerful personal brand. And everybody has the power to communicate. So we are no stranger to what's happening in the world today, right? We understand the importance of communications. We understand the importance of digital. We understand the importance of being online. So how do you make sure that you can use your brand or things that you're personally passionate about relevant in the marketplace. Now there's, there's a lot of people online. There's a lot of people doing things. So how should you be approaching it? And I get this question a lot, like, isn't personal branding about self-promotion and bragging about yourself? And I did this and I did that and I'm so good and I'm so good and I'm so this. It's really not. Personal branding is really about leadership. So, and I want to just stay on this for a minute. The reason why it's about leadership is if you have an expertise in an area or you are passionate about something in an area, whether it's your job, whether it's a side hustle, whether it's a hobby, you can lead in that space and you should be part of that conversation in that space. So the way you approach talking about things you're personal about or your personal brand is how you make sure it's not about self-promotion and it's about leadership. So here's what I'm going to do. In order to set a good example, I'm going to walk you guys through my personal brand journey and how I, I think about it. That way you have a good local example to see all the different types of things you can do to build your brand. And then I'm going to walk you through some steps you guys can take. So in my journey, I was like, well, if not me, who? So I am 50 years old. I'm not afraid to say it. I have had an illustrious career in communications, working for some of the most high profile people in companies in the region, right? So I'm proud of what I've done. Like I had to do the work first. I had to, you know, work with Nagib and work with Gary and work with Google and, and really earn kind of my credentials in terms of being a communications expert. I don't just wake up one day and become a comms expert. I had to like do like almost a thousand press conferences and manage a bunch of different crises. So I thought, well, if not me to be in, uh, sharing what I care about, which is communications, then who? So if you think about your, your, your um, expertise as it compares to other people, think about, oh, I have something unique to add and I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm out there doing it. So what do I love to do? So I spent a lot of time looking inwards at myself. Like, what am I good at? What do I like to do? And I, I went through this exercise, which we won't do today because there isn't enough time, but how to get to that narrative and how to get to that one thing. And mine was help people communicate better. So like, that's what I love to do. I love to help people communicate better. And I went through this, this journey to exercise to figure out like, what are my mission? What is my values? What are the things that I'm consistently interested in? So I want you guys to think about that. If you were to narrow down, what are those things that you think you really care about doing? Doesn't matter how you're going to do it or in what format you're going to do it, but just dial down to like, I really love making people feel good about themselves. Is that through teaching them how to write? Is that through teaching them how to be a better uh, eater? Or am I teaching them through fitness? Am I teaching them through photography? And then what format do I feel comfortable doing it? So I don't really love doing videos. I don't like the way I look. I don't like the way I have to worry about my hair and my makeup and my clothes and the lighting and the sound and the microphone. It's just too much elements to be doing videos for me. So I'm like, but I'm comfortable talking. I'm comfortable communicating. I'll do a podcast. Like I can do that. Like I like to do things in, an, in a format that I'm comfortable doing. 
And then how do I scale it? Well, how do I make sure that I'm able to, instead of having, when I had my communications company, somebody would have to hire me to work with me or my team, right? So you know, I can only take on so many clients. I can only take on so many people that I coach, right? So what I would do is figure out how do I scale it? Well, maybe I'll create a blog and share what I do. Maybe I'll use my Instagram account. Maybe I'll use my LinkedIn account. Maybe I'll create a podcast. So scaling it is, is the exercise of trying to figure out how you can help more than one-to-one -one person. So try to find a medium or a platform that helps you scale it to multiple people. And then what does my audience care about? So this is kind of coming back to the whole point about personal branding, self-promotion versus leadership. And we'll go through this in a couple of slides, but there's a rule, it's called the 80-20% rule. Like 80% of your content should be things that your audience actually cares about or wants to know. And you're like, well, Maha, how do I know what they wanna know? How do I know what my audience cares about? It's really simple, ask them. So all you have to do, all the information you need to know about your brand and what people care about or what people like about your content or what people want to know is available on your phone, right? All you need to do is you can create an Instagram story, ask a question, ask a poll. You can look at hashtags. You can find out what kinds of things audiences are caring about. What kind of topics are they following? So let's say your example, you're really interested in sharing your photography because you want to sell it as a side hustle. So you find out what kind of photography people like. Do they like still photography, black and white photography? Are they interested in, uh, I don't know enough about photography to give examples, but just you, you can find out what people want based on looking at asking your audience and looking up trends and the Twitter trends are really, really good to look at. Instagram trends are really look good to look at. LinkedIn has the same. So find out what your audience cares about and focus your attention there. Because if I'm talking to you about things you're interested in, you're gonna engage more, you're gonna come back more, you're gonna recommend more, you're gonna find out that you really do build and grow your audience by giving them consistent content that they care about. And then last one was like, how can I show people the authentic me? So if you guys follow me, you see, I am like, you know, following the protest, tweeting about my dog or talking about like my family in Minnesota or whatever. So it's not just all business. It's like the things that I care about. People who follow me know the things that I care about. And, and I think one of the things that this moment in history is teaching us now is how much authenticity matters how much being yourself and showing your true values and who you are and what you stand for matters now more than ever. Brands need to be authentic. People need to be authentic. Um, consumers, and just put yourself in your shoes. What do you, do you, you can see bullshit when, from far away. So you don't want to put that out in your content either. So show people the authentic uh, version of who you are, and that'll come through. That'll come through in your content and will really help engage and stick to your audience. So let me show you a couple of things. So first things first, the podcast, I created that. It was like a weekly show. Anybody can create a podcast. If you guys have an iPhone or you have an Android, there's a voice recorder on your phone. All you need to do is literally push that button, play it. And then if you want to edit it, you can, or if you want to hire someone to help you do the sound, uh, you know, editing and engineering, you can do that. I will show you all the thumbnails that are created for my podcast. Like I do them myself. I don't have a designer who's helping me do it. So just like I created the podcast audio is super is simple. You guys can create a podcast. And if you're not sure, like if podcast is right for you, my advice to you would be to start listening, listen to a bunch of different shows. What kind of stuff do you see on the topics you're interested? In? And then where would be the space where you could enter? The second thing, if you go to the next slide, is just like, I actually, you know, people would ask me to be on other podcasts and I did. I wasn't like, oh, what's the ranking of that podcast? Is that a great podcast or not? Like all of these are amazing podcasts, but like it, you get exposure by being on other people's podcast networks, audiences, and you get exposed to their, um, their audiences and their networks and share information for that. So don't say no to opportunities that might come your way because you might not think they're the right ones. 
The second, another thing that I did is I started to volunteer. I don't have any secret sauce weapons with any of these journalists to say, hey, um, can I write for you? So what I did was I wrote a bunch of pieces, like the one that I just published in Entrepreneur. I just basically emailed them. I'm like, hey, I have an idea. I really want to share it with you. I really encourage you guys to like look at the platforms, the news articles or the news, the blogs or the things that you care about and volunteer to step up to offer them content for free and and you should not be expected to get paid because nobody gets paid for that but it helps position you as a thought leader and so i just started to write a bunch of articles and like last week i was like i contacted you know somebody that i know at cnbc and i'm like really i'd love to write about things related to the workplace and can i write for you guys and there are here's five or six articles ideas i had would those be interesting and they're like yeah send us your thoughts we'd love to see them you can't get a no unless you ask. So you have to make sure you're asking and you have to be able to, you know, try to put yourself in a position where you might get, you know, you put out 10, you know, opportunities, maybe one of them comes back, but you have to keep trying. Speaking at events. So there's different ways to speak at events. Obviously it's what's going on with COVID. It's a little bit different, but like one of the things that I would do is I would volunteer to give keynotes. So by, by myself on stage. The second thing, if you go to the next slide, is you know try to offer to be on panels. So do research. So here's one thing that I would do, especially in COVID. You know, obviously this is another another example. Is you can you can give a keynote, you can be on a panel, you can offer to be a moderator, ask questions, you can give free training. So do free training at workshops at big public events that are taking place. And then I think there's one more. I did like a, Shara, a Charja and Shara. Like I just offered to do free, free training for startups and stuff like that. Um, what's the next slide? So before I go into this, I just want to go back on just talking about, you can leave the slide, it's fine, about speaking at events and volunteering. So right now there's a lot of webinars going on. There's a lot of virtual events taking place. And so you're like, well, how can I get into one of these events? How can, if I don't have a name, if I don't have a career that people know me for, how can I really try to be on stage or in a panel or moderate something? So you got to do some research. So you go to the event that you want to participate in or you want to be a part of, and you should do some research on that site. Who are some of the speakers that spoke at that event before? Do you know any of those speakers? Do you know anybody who might know any of those speakers? Can you reach out to those speakers on LinkedIn or through Instagram direct message and say, hey, I saw that you spoke at this event last year. I would really love to volunteer to either give a keynote speech or be on a panel or be a moderator. Do you mind introducing me to the event organizers? So one thing is go through the list of the speakers that were there before. The second thing to do is you can go to that event site and usually there'll be like partners or things on the bottom of the um, of the event, like media partners or some of the other partners that were banks or people who were the sponsors. Try to reach out and say, okay, do I know any of those sponsors? Do I know any of those partners from that event? Is it possible for me to go, you know, reach out to somebody, go through LinkedIn, see if there's any common networks? that's how I did it. Like you just dig and move and research and you just gotta, and then you ask, and then you go to the people who are organizing the event and you have to come by adding value. I would like to come talk at this event and I'm going to add value by talking about this. And you should come in with thought starters. Don't go to the event organizers hoping that they're going to figure you out by reading your biography or watching a couple links of videos that you send them go the extra step and give them the information they need to make a decision. So even when working like with when people that I would, my teams and people that I've worked with through the years, I'm like, give them all the information they need to make a decision. Don't leave room for information where they may have to go do research. So that'll delay them getting back to you. Try to package all the information they need to make a decision and give it to them at the same time. So the next slide was just going through like what I have done in terms of investing in a few things. So one is I took some profile pictures. I'm like, I better have a couple of nice photos that I actually like. So I hired a photographer in Dubai who took a bunch of pictures of me and then we shortlisted the ones I liked and edited those. So at least I have some different profile pictures. And then I did hire a producer for my podcast just because 
I'm not that tech savvy, even though I worked with a lot of tech companies. And so I just wanted someone to make sure that we figured out the audio, that it was balanced, that like it was on a hosting platform that was available everywhere. Um, I, I can send you guys the details of who I used. Um, it's Shirag, who from MAFM. Um, if you guys can like go to my podcast, you'll see he's details are in there. He's amazing and he's super affordable. So if you guys want him, big shout out to that guy who does my podcast. Um, sorry, can you go back? Um, thumbnails. So kind of coming up with the thumbnails and then all the creative, like all this silly, you know, not silly, but like the creative that I did, I actually did those myself. I'm like, oh, this might be fun. I'm not creatively inclined, but like it gets the message across. The most important thing is people listen to the podcast. I don't think everyone's looking at the artwork, but it's a good way for you to understand the theme and the the title of of the um, of the show. And the reason I'm showing you this is like to create a personal brand. You don't need to invest a lot of money. There are so many templates out there. If you go to Canva, they have templates. If you go to your iPhone or your app store, if you're on Google play, there's a ton of free templates that are out there to create stuff. So you can put a quote on there. You can do all kinds of things. So really the internet's got so many free resources. You guys should really take advantage of those. So let's talk about your personal brand. So I don't know if there's any questions that we want to take until the very end, um, but we'll take those at the end. I think there's a lot coming through right now. Um, so kind of looking at your personal brand and the checklist, hold on, I can't get rid of this Q&A thing, um, is the first thing you should do is a digital audit. So what is a digital audit? So a digital audit is basically looking at all the different things that you have online. So is your bio describing who you are? Does your bio give you somewhere where someone can reach you? Is there an email? Is there a website? Is there a way where that person can contact you? Um, does your bio have a really clean picture? Is it you with somebody else? Then get rid of that somebody else. Um, so make sure that your bios are super clean in all your different platforms. So your Twitter, your Instagram, your Facebook, your LinkedIn. And then spend some time looking at the content that you're putting out. What are some of the things that you really wish you were doing more of? What are some of the things that you wish that you, you know, you want to try to start thinking about putting out in terms of, let's say you are somebody who really loves to cook and wants to be helping people cook vegan food. That might be something that's your personal brand. So is the content that you're putting out there consistent with that? How much time are you spending educating your audience, getting to know your audience, asking your, your audience questions? Anyways, there's a whole checklist, which I'm sure Summer, we can, we can share with everyone one so they have that. The second thing is your brand values and so do your mission statement. Sorry, I'm going to stay here for a few more minutes is going through the exercise. And it's just basically a list of questions that I can give you guys right now. But like, what are some of the things that I care about? What are some of the things that I think I'm really good at that I want to focus on sharing with other people? If you were to ask a few of my friends or a few of my colleagues or a few of the people closest to me that stand out about me, what would those things be? So what you're trying to do is build your narrative. Like what is the thing that stands out that you really want to help people with and that you think that's something you either want to build into a side hustle, build into a career, or you have a career and it matches what you are want your personal brand to be focused on. Let's say you are a really, uh, really big expert in, in helping people understand financial literacy, like how to be better about saving money and how to be better. And that's your job. And it's actually something that you want to kind of really help people do because you feel people are really bad at money management. Then your mission statement, your brand values should be about helping people feel better about financial security or financial literacy. Um, a personal board of directors is something that I, I started to practice uh, probably about 10 years ago. Um, it's, it's really, I make a list of people who care about me, 
but who are also the people who are willing to kind of stand up to me and tell it like it is and really give me feedback in a way that is constructive to me and helps me grow as an individual. So my personal board of directors has on it like my sister and has like this, uh, this executive from Coca-Cola who was one of my clients who became like a really close friend of mine. And it's and a really good friend of mine from Egypt who then moved to Dubai. Like, so I have people on my personal board of directors that I kind of write a board, of, like a founder's letter. Like, this is what I'm really focused on this year. And then I have check-ins with them like every six months just to kind of hold me accountable and to talk about some of the things that I want to get feedback on or I'm interested in doing. And if I'm going to have a job change or a career change or a move change, or I want to do something new, or I want to I want to take on something. So you guys should think about it. It's a really interesting idea. And I just love having sort of like companies have them, but if you have a personal brand, why wouldn't you have one of those as well? Because you should take it just as, a, as seriously as a, as a company board of directors. Um, digital reputation has to do with like, what happens when you Google your, yourself? What are some of the things that you find that you, you don't like that are on there? Like everything on the internet is obviously there. You can't obviously scrub it off or rub it down, but just think about like wanting to push the content that you want to be promoting to be rising to the top. So all of you guys, obviously you guys know how Google works, the web traffic that gets the most, uh, the sites that get the most web traffic always float to the top on your Google search. So, I mean, there's many factors, but that's probably the biggest. Um, making sure that when you Google yourself, you like what you see, you like the pictures that are out there, making sure you're mindful about videos and things that you're putting out on the internet because it will be there five, 10, 20 million years from now. So making sure you're looking at that. And then last but not least, like, your network is your net worth. And I think you guys have heard that a lot. But I would say that the unique thing about me might be my network, it may not be my secret sauce in being good at communications. I think it might be the network. Like, how do you create a strong network? How do you really build relationships with people and add value to them even when you get nothing from it? So when I introduce Nagib and Gary to each other, there's no value for me in that relationship except for seeing like both of my, my former boss and my current boss like me, that brings me a lot. But there might be a lot of business value that's created from that. And that's the network. That's creating value for them, not for me. But what could be interesting for Gary and Nagib if I bring those two together? Could you guys even imagine? I can't. But I'm just thinking about like how you create a network. It's not necessarily about what's in it for you. It's what's in it for them and creating that value for them. Um, okay, so I put so many words on this page on purpose, but like content comes in many forms. So everyone's like, oh, I don't want to make videos. I don't want to sit on Instagram and be the camera. I think you guys would rarely find me straight to camera talking on Instagram. I just don't, I'm, I can do it. I just don't prefer to do it. So there's a lot of different things you guys can do and ask me anything, a podcast, a live chat, a tweet, a quote card would be basically a tweet in a card, a diagram, a poster, like having a personal brand doesn't mean your face. And I think a lot of people think that they think it is. You could be an expert in something through storytelling that has nothing to do with your face being a part of it. And I think that's what makes people afraid of being a personal brand is like, you think, oh, it has to be me. No, it's the leadership. It's the thought leadership. It's the ideas you have. It's the content that you're sharing with others. Like I have a couple, I have two really good friends that are like, really good at like they do exercises and fitness and they're both in Dubai and they're both Egyptian. And one of them I think might be on here, but like, I just get inspired. Like she's a personal brand for me. Like I get inspired by what she does and how she eats and she shows me what she eats and how she eats and how she exercises. And, and she's not necessarily in all the videos, it could be like a really great image of the food and then she explains or the exercises and then she tags all the exercises. That's a personal brand. Like she's a mom who's working out, who's showing me how to do it in her bedroom, in her living room, in her small space. And that's, that's really creating, um, creating value for me as a, as a, as a, as a consumer or a user. So 80 per 20% rule on the content. 80% of the content should be about what your audience cares about. 20% should be about you. So like, let's say, for example, what does that mean for like someone like me? So like, 
20% of the time I might be talking about where I'm going to be speaking next or where I'm going to be um, doing a webinar or an article that I'm really proud of that I wrote. And 80% of the time should be adding value either in building my brand and talking about things I care about and helping people understand communications and sharing information about what's going on in today's context or world. So the 80% should be about what um, they care about and 20% should be about, you know, the self-promotion thing or the informational things they need to know about how to engage with you. Um, writing is hard. So everyone's like, well, what if one of the things I'm doing for content has nothing to do with writing, which it could be, but any copy you're going to do, any captions you're going to write is going to have to involve writing. So you can always edit a bad page. You can't edit a blank page. And I always come back to this because I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book and I've been working on it for a while, but I like, it takes time to sit down and write. And I always try to say to myself, just start, no matter what I'm going to write about, just start. Even if I only write a paragraph that day or write one page one day, the water doesn't flow until the faucet is turned on. So I want you guys to just keep that in your head. Like, okay, starting is hard, but then once you start, just do it. And don't worry about it being perfect. Just give yourself wins under your belt of like the practice of creating content, putting it out, creating content, putting it out. Don't overthink it, create it and put it out. And then when you feel more comfortable, then you can spend time putting it in a, in a way that makes you feel, you know, that it's a little bit more polished and, and, you know, people want authenticity. So don't worry about being too polished. Next slide. So being a, good, being a good communicator, what it takes is self-awareness. So self-awareness is an example of me saying, I'm not comfortable being on camera, but I am comfortable with my voice and I do love talking, which a lot of my friends would say, oh my God, does she love talking? But like self-awareness is knowing the difference between what you are comfortable doing, what you're not comfortable doing. Are you comfortable hiring somebody? Are you not? Are you comfortable using a template or not? Self-awareness is understanding where do you sit in the spectrum of things that make you comfortable versus uncomfortable. Listening, a really good portion of you guys should spend time before creating content, listening. That means going to websites, looking at other pages, listening to what other people are doing, looking up hashtags, listening to the comments that people are making on your page, listening to the insights that you're getting from the data that you're finding, and really listening and then using that to drive what you wanna be doing. Um, practicing, I already, already covered this, like practice, 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 practice. It doesn't get better unless you keep practicing. It doesn't get easier unless you keep practicing and try to get feedback from your audience. So I think you guys have all seen this on pages. Like, do you guys like this or not? Would you like to see more of this from me or not? Would you rather see videos or not? Like, would you rather see, like, just ask. The easiest way to get an answer is to ask them. And then tell stories and be superhuman. Like you, if you guys follow me, you'll see, like, I just, I am who I am. Like one day I'll be posting about this. One day I'll be posting about that, but just tell stories. People love to follow a good storyteller and we re live in real time. Social media is really here to say it's not too late. If everyone thinks like I only have two followers or 10 followers or 400 followers, start now because like two years from now you're not going to have 400 followers like the only way to grow your audience is to start now so don't think about doing it you know i don't have any followers no one's going to see my message if you keep building and building and building and building and you're consistent it'll work um adopting a growth mindset means you're always going to think about ways for you to grow and how you can grow with your audience and try to be a lifelong learner like Learn about, I learned about Canva, I didn't know how to use it. Learn about something you don't know um, and seek to learn um, from others and then build your personal brand now. Like if you guys have learned anything from this session today, it's like, just start, you can do it and you can build your personal brand. And if there's anything I can do, I'd be happy to reach out to you guys or reach out to me directly. You can um, follow me or subscribe to my podcast or email me and we'll be doing more training. But Thanks you guys for listening and I'll leave it back to Summer to go over questions. Thank you so much, Maha. This was awesome. I'm sure all the uh, attendees would agree. And honestly, as she's Arab, we're very grateful. You're basically 
walking the talk. Like it's exactly what you said in your entrepreneur um, magazine article. You are sharing value with us, with our network, with your followers. So uh, we really appreciate this. And I want to say that it, it is a good idea to maybe share a few of these resources after the webinar. So we'll talk about that and we'll do it for sure. And I must applaud the idea of the personal board of directors. This is like amazing. I mean, we've always talked about having mentors, having sponsors, but really thinking of a group of people and referring back to them every few months or whatever, you know, these were my targets. Am I on target or not? I think this is amazing. Uh, so thank you for that. We have a lot of questions, but um, before we get to them, although there are a lot, I just have a few questions here and there for you. So in general, do you think that anyone is capable of being a good communicator? Yeah, I think everyone has the power to communicate in any format that they like. So you don't necessarily have to go and be a public speaker or to be doing, like I said, straight to videos. Like, I mean, we covered this, like as long as you have self-awareness about the things you're interested and talking about and doing, everybody has the ability. I think Warren Buffett just did this thing that came out last year and it's like the most important skill that people need to have is public speaking and communications, right? You guys, everything will go out of style except for communications. Like we're always gonna need to do it. It's not like food, eating and <laughs> communications are things that we have to learn how to be contemporary communicators and how to use the internet to tell our stories and how to use the skills that we have and the things we're passionate about to tell them. Great. And I want to know what would you say the role of the jobs that you had? I mean, you were fortunate to work for some amazing organizations. What if these, um, you know, jobs or companies that you've associated yourself with um, had, have they had a role to play in building your own personal brand? And I mean, what if somebody works in an industry, but they want to position themselves or create a personal brand in a different industry. Can you reflect a little bit on that? Yeah. So just taking your second question. So let's say you work in finance and accounting and you really want to be a personal brand, a blogger about uh, yoga. Can you do that? Yes, you should do that. So how to separate your job from your personal brand is just starting by focusing on the listening first to the audiences, finding your space and build it. You don't, you, you don't have to have the same, you know, work persona as you do your personal brand. Like everyone needs to be consistent and authentic to who they are as a personal brand. And so you have to carve out that space. That means you have to talk about things outside of work on your personal pages and use your personal pages just to go deep and re consistently and repeat and repeat and repeat. Like I actually found there are a lot of people that I know through work and then I find their personal pages and they have really different interests and things that they're promoting. And I would might want to work with them as like a fitness trainer or a consultant on a different activity that I didn't know that they were involved in. And their personal page allowed me to learn that about them. I see. No, you, I think you have a great point there. Um, I think on the same point, I'd also like to touch on the issue of some people are shy to share about themselves. And there's usually a fine line between, you know, showing off or bragging and, and hence, you know, lacking authenticity and losing your audience. So how do you manage this? You know, at yeah. so actually, I had a private account um, up until like last year, because I was just like, oh, I don't want to put myself out there and like, I post pictures of my family and like all this kind of stuff. Like I really was like, I don't really want to have a public account. And, and then I was like, well, I'm never going to grow my audience and I'm never going to scale to help more people unless I do. So I have to be a little bit more, you know, vulnerable in terms of what I want to do. And, and I am shy. Like I said, I don't like being on video, although this is so fun actually. Um, but I just want to make sure that I do things that I'm comfortable doing and I'm comfortable putting myself in a situation where I'm putting things out there. So people who are shy, who don't feel like they can, don't be on camera, don't be your face, do infographics, do memes, do like humor, like find other ways to do your storytelling that doesn't involve your face. And millions of people do that. And Maha, when it comes to women as well, women are particularly known to be even more um, shy than men. Like, what would you tell women in our network? Um, if, you know, for them, this is even a, more of a struggle. And I mean, this is really part of the ethos of why we started She is Arab. 
you know, to address this issue of like underrepresentation of Arab women, them not being there, uh, you know, at conferences and events and, and even in business leadership positions, because I mean, these, the lack of their presence at these events is truly a reflection of how poorly they, they, they're represented in business, right? Yeah. So if not you, if not you, who is the yeah. question that I would say? And I actually, you know, in 2000 in Egypt, there were no females that were managing directors of any companies except for one. There was a Sahar Nasr who was the head of Promo 7 in Egypt. There were no managing director women that I was always in a room with a bunch of guys. So like, I understand how that works, but like, if not you, who? And it takes, it starts with one step and you have to start. And if, if women feel that they're not getting um, a chance to have their voices heard, then they should try to use the platforms to do that and try to really step up and engage in a way that they feel comfortable doing. Great. Um, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to skip a couple of questions, but I want to move on to um, the issue of networking. Um, and you've highlighted it clearly as being super important. You know, um, I, there is even a study by Adler and LinkedIn that mentioned that 85% of jobs are actually filled through networking. So that only emphasizes how important this issue is. Um, tell us more about I mean, in your case, networking played a major role. How did you meet Gary V? How did you end up doing what you're doing now? Yeah, I mean, most of the, um, the most of the networks, like how did I meet Nagib and how did I meet Gary and uh, and Ian? How did I get to Google and all that kind of stuff? Is like I stepped up. I was just like, I wanted to make a difference and I wanted to, you know, I was seeking seeking like new opportunities and new relationships and new ways to add value. So the Gary story in a nutshell is very simple. I had never heard of him. I did never read any of his books. I never followed him on social media. I was in the States for the summer in 2017. And a friend of mine said, you should buy this book called Crush It that Gary wrote. It's a very small book. I recommend all of you guys to read it. And the book talks a lot about creating your own platform and your personal brand and how you should like, if you have expertise, you should share it and you should grow your own thing and rely on yourself. And I'm like, oh, well, I've been doing communications. I should have my own platform. And that's how I created Digital and Savvy. And I'm like, I'll do a blog and a podcast. So I don't want to be in a video. So I just, that's kind of started getting my feet into this whole personal branding space. And then um, I started following Gary on Instagram and I never like, you know, he puts out a lot of content. So you have to like watch all the videos. So he did an interview with this woman named Cy Wakeman and Cy Wakeman had like this extraordinary book and I was so inspired by her. And so I commented on her post and I DM'd her, which is one of the things that Gary said to do is like reach out to people and just start talking to them. So I did. And I told her I loved her and I'd love to meet her and I'd love to bring her to the Middle East. And I have no idea how I'm bringing her to the Middle East. I have no opportunities for her. I went to meet the folks at Rise Up like a couple months after that. And um, they were looking for a speaker in size space. So I'm like, oh, well, maybe I can get Sai to come and speak. And so I asked Sai. She said, yes, I'm a total stranger. I sent her a really nice DM and I said, if you send me your email, your team. So I sent a really professional email to her team introducing myself. So I'm not like a stalker. Here's who I am. Would love you to come and speak. She came to Egypt, had the most magical week. She did rise up. This was a couple of years, 2018, if you guys remember. She spoke. She had a videographer with her filming all of her personal brand content and her journey and her speeches. And this gentleman worked for Vayner Media for Gary's um, company. So I was like, can I meet? I'd love to meet Gary. We should open Weber, or like I opened Weber Shanwick in the Middle East. We should open Vayner Media in the Middle East. So that's why I reached out to Gary was say, hey, you should open Vayner Media in the Middle East. And so I got to meet Gary and I got to know him. And then we started talking and then he's like, well, what do you do? And I'm like, well, I do communications and I can open a business for you. And I stepped up. I volunteered for like a year for all of 2018. I basically was adding value. I was like, this is what the Middle East market's about. Here's what's happening in the region. Why don't you let me do a presentation to your team? I was just like, how about creating Gary V in Arabic? I know how people, a team of people who can create your content. If you guys don't follow, you should, because we created the page of creating your content in Arabic. I just proactively just bombarded him with ideas. And then he was like, okay, I'm listening. And so that's basically, I spent time 
adding value to him. And then he's like, why don't you do some work for me as a consultant? So I did. Um, and I, we worked together all of last year, all of 2019. Then he's like, you should, you should join the company full time this year. And so I did in January. That's truly inspirational. I mean, but it does take courage. It's the same as the example you gave earlier about, you know, going to CNBC or, you know, a volunteering. Let me write about this. Let me talk about that. Add value. You got to just push to add value, especially if you're launching a personal brand and you want it. Nobody knows who you are. You, I just did that. I, and I, at my age with my experience, you're like, Oh, you shouldn't be working for free. Like some things you do add value. Cause you know that there's a big opportunity that you want to be a part of and you just really push. Mm-hmm. And so you know that you could, you know, add a lot of value to them. Yeah, if somebody is not, um, good at sharing stories or writing stories or creating content, would you recommend that they, for example, get a ghostwriter, um, get some help with creating content? Or do you really believe that everybody can, you know, develop good content? You know, first of all, there's so many free resources online, take an online course. There's so many free things to learn. So what skills you don't have, you can easily acquire them by going online, the internet, and it's free. (laughs) So that's the first thing. You don't need to invest, like invest in the things you want to pay money for. Like, do you want to buy a really nice camera so you can take nice content? Do that. Like, do you want, like, that is a good investment. Like I bought camera equipment. I'm not very good at using it, but like I went and bought the camera and I bought the light ring. Like, so when I have the video content, invest where you need to invest and the rest is available for free. There's a ton of free templates. There's a front of free, free online courses and it, it just take advantage of all the stuff that's out there. The reason I don't like the ghostwriter thing, um, and depending on what everyone's doing is you want it to be your voice. You shouldn't outsource your personal brand. Like you shouldn't outsource someone to write your copy. Like you should, you know, have your ideas and then have someone help you tell them better. So what you're saying is basically if you're capable, you know, at least give it a, give it a shot, at least try first, get a, get a course, uh, try it out, see how it works out for you. And if it doesn't work, you know, there are always alternative solutions. Um, okay, so what are we going to do about all these questions? So what I'd like to do, because I don't know how you guys run these things, because we're going to be running out of time. I do want to answer every single question just because the fact that they came and took time to come here means okay. I need to take time to answer every single one. So if we can download them or somehow get them, I really want to answer all of these. Sure. Well, most of them are actually, a lot of them are saying, thank you for being the, be, being here. It's lovely to watch this. Good morning from even Portland, Oregon. Um, but there's a question I wanted to ask you from an anonymous attendee. It said, how do you balance your time between personal branding activities and revenue generating work? Is it 50-50 mm-hmm. or do you focus on personal branding only in your free time? That is the million dollar question. So it's like, oh, should I spend time working on my personal content or spend time getting clients? So this is before when I was working, before I was working full time with Gary. So what are you guys doing on your nights and weekends? That's where you should spend time to working on your personal brand, right? So you spend your extra time instead of spending all those hours watching Netflix or doing things where you probably should be, if you really care about investing in your personal brand, you got to put in the time. Just like if you want to lose weight, you got to put in the time working out and eating better. Like you just have to put in the time. So that's how I balance it. Like I now on the weekends, like before I was like, oh, the weekends, I need to unwind and relax. And now because weekends are like days, like everything's together. It's like every weekend, I have content time. I sit and plan what I'm going to be working on. I sit and like record my podcast every Sunday now. So we had, we actually had an episode we were going to come out with today, but given the circumstances, we're going to change it. So like we're adapting and adjusting to make sure that it's not tone deaf and that it's appropriate. So we're going to push it back probably a week. It was actually about crisis communications, but like that's the kind of thing as a personal brand, you can pivot. And so spending our weekend, like work, I'm redoing my entire blog. Like I do that on the weekends and I do that on at nights and I just find time for it because it's just the easiest thing to put on the back burner because you have to focus on your job and delivering for your job and you're getting paid for your job, but like grow it over time. And then don't be too hard on yourself. Like if you get one thing done, like set a goal for the month and try to get that done. 
And I think that now with working from home and everything, we actually have more time to spend on that. We have a few questions about, you know, sharing your article. We'll do that. Yes, the session will be recorded. It will be on YouTube on our channel, which we'll share that with you as well. Do you have specific tips to connect with C-levels on LinkedIn? Are there any tips for that? Yeah, I mean, I have actually... <laughs> Let me be honest with you. I don't like LinkedIn DMing people on LinkedIn that you know or don't know is just an it's an it's awkward thing for some people, right? So the most the best thing to do is try to get someone to introduce you. That is the easiest thing to do is like, hey, I noticed from LinkedIn because you can see who they know that you know so and so. Would you mind doing an introduction for me? That is far more successful than cold messaging somebody because do you guys like it when people like cold dm you in the linkedin and selling you something probably not right the other thing you can do is you can start a thread and do you guys know when like in linkedin you can have like two people or three people be on a group so we do this at vayner media all the time it's like i know somebody i want to introduce them to gary so i would get on a thread with me that person and gary and that makes like a conversation and a really interesting way to meet a c-suite person is to invite somebody else into that conversation with you Okay, that's a great tip, actually. What's the rule about comments on social media posts? Should they always respond, not respond? What is your policy? So if you are taking the time to write a post and you, you have a valuable follower, you should respond to every single comment. Even if it's an emoji or a reaction, you definitely need to respond to those comments. Like people who are your users or your followers, you like, I always make sure that I go in and respond to every single comment. Makes sense. What do you think of having a personal website? I mean, for a while, all communicators were recommending this. Would you still recommend it? How would it be useful and what should it include? It's your brand. It's your name. You should own it. You should have it. So you really still recommend that everyone should have a personal brand, despite the fact that they have a LinkedIn account, a Facebook account, they're everywhere on social media. You can go and own your URL everywhere. Whether you use it or not, you should go get it. So nobody has your identity online. So I have mahabulanane.com. I have, I have all the variations of my name on every single platform, even if I don't use it, just because I want to own my name. So it's either Maha Geber. Geber is my middle name in the Middle mm -hmm. East. It's very common for your first and your middle name to be your full name. But so Maha Geber is like my name on most of my social platforms. My work, obviously, name is Mahabulanane, but like I'm under both and I reserve both. Okay, great. Um, there's a question from uh, Maha, another Maha, uh, who says she needs a mentor in the field of comms and advocacy, how to find a mentor and from where I can start. Maha, I'd like to start by saying that we're actually hosting, as she is Arab, a webinar on June 21st about that in particular, um, in collaboration with a mentoring network called The Link. So I would recommend that you join us on this webinar. And I'd love to hear Maha's tips, if specifically on comms and advocacy, what would would you recommend? So like finding a mentor is really, um, you know, important if you really want to learn from someone who's been doing it for a long time. It's a matter of finding a mentor who has time and who really articulating what you really would love to learn from that mentor helps that mentor know where to focus their time. So I have mentor, I mentor some people, but like we basically have like an action plan of like, these are the things that the, the time schedule that works for them. These are the things that they really want to focus on. And then I make sure as the mentor that I'm giving the mentee the value in the, in the area that they want the most. So articulating, I really want you to be my mentor. This is why I want you to be my mentor. These are the things I'd love you to help me with. Or I saw that you did this. Can you help me learn more about that? You know, just being specific about your ask. Okay, makes sense. Um, how long does it take? We have a question from Innocent. How long does it take to build your personal brand, more specifically your company brand? So what's a realistic time frame to review and confirm if your brand is doing well? Time. Is there there's no time stamp. Like, so building a reputation takes time, right? So how does a brand like an Apple or a Nike get a really good reputation? You have to be consistent over time. So reputation management, and I always talk about this in terms of your reputation in terms of currency, like what's it worth? What's its value? Like, how do you grow it? So you should always think about building, like, I didn't ever think I was a personal brand. I actually wouldn't think that way today. Although I would say I am an expert in communications just because I've done it consistently over time. 
-hmm. I've been doing it over time for different people. I did it for Nagib. I did it for Google. I did it for Netflix. I did it for Kareem. I did it for Gary. Like that's consistency in doing the same thing. So I think for me and for you guys to think about how do you build your brand, just try to be super consistent over time. Okay, and about Gary, about the same point. Uh, Mariska says, Gary is such an amazing human. Just love that story. So excited for you, Maha. And someone else is asking, uh, what was the biggest challenge? That's from Nat. What was the biggest challenge in managing the brand of Gary and how did you deal with it? First of all, I don't manage a brand of Gary at all. <laughs> Gary manages his own brand, but like just helping introduce him to people, helping him add value to him. Like, you know, he is a machine <laughs> for anyone who knows who, how he operates, but that's, that's the challenge for me. Like, how do I add value to somebody like him? How do I add value to someone like Nagib Sawiris? Like, these are people that are accomplished business people. So I have to figure out how do I make sure that every day I'm adding value to his business and his brand, either it's through relationships, if it's helping get press to talk about, raise awareness for something he's interested in. Like, you know, he is a... Um, a different type of leader. Like he is leads with empathy. He's very much about self-awareness. He's very much about kindness. He, he's very much about culture and human first. There aren't a lot of CEOs that aren't like, how much did you make? What are the money? Where's the numbers? Where's the result? Like Nagib is a very different uh, CEO and businessman. Like it's a very different mentality in terms of like how they lead and manage people. Like he's just an innovate, Nagib is just an innovative, iconic person who's just so patriotic and wants to do good for the country and the people. And his, the way he managed was very different than the way Gary does and the way Google did and other companies that are out there. Makes sense. He is a brand. He's definitely a success story. He's a brand on his own. Um, there are a lot of like thank yous. There's, I just want to read this in particular from Allison who said, just wanted to say I left the UAE in January and returned to Ireland. Maha was an inspiration when I lived there and continues to be so. Really appreciate your generosity of time and expertise. Thank you. So I had to read this out because it's so like- oh, you guys are the best. This makes me feel so good. It's so nice to talk to people and be out here. Oh, there's Doha. Hi, Doha. Lots of people. Say, I'm um, just kind of going in and answer some people. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a, there's a lot to answer. To be honest, I'm, I've thanked a lot of them, a lot uh, of thank yous, and a lot of people. I'd like you all to know that you know we're very proud to have Maha as part of our network. So as I mentioned earlier, we will be sending all these resources, and we will be as she is Arab also launching a bunch of you know trainings on personal branding, on uh, public speaking, and so on. So please don't shy away and keep following uh, what's yet to come. Um, what else do we have? Um, can't wait to implement, especially that I'm shifting my career. What is your strategy for filtering all the noise on social networks and making sure that quality in networking, there's quality in networking? What would you say to that? Uh, quality in networking, in terms, sorry, I was on the thing yeah. answering people. <laughs> quality rather than quantity. And you know, the quantity doesn't compromise the quality. So how do you filter all the noise? How, how do you get strategic on social media? How do you get strategic on social media? It's just about the relationships that you're building and try to engage with a lot of people, right? So engaging in the conversations that are meaningful to you. It's not rocket science. Like, you know, unfollow the accounts that you don't care about. Focus on following the accounts that you really want to lean into and engage more with. Um, you know, DMing people is the most under, especially in Instagram, it's so, 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 so effective. Like, I can't believe sometimes how easy it is for me to reach celebrities and and, and really important people. I, I just know how to pitch to the press. So like I write a really nice message and I'm like, really? That guy, I, I get a lot of biting. So like, let's say for your personal brand, you wanna get some press coverage. You can mm -hmm. also start like following journalists on Twitter, following them on Instagram, finding out what people, what those journalists are writing about. That's another way to get the word out about your personal brand. but. Never underestimate the the um, the power of an Instagram DM. It's different on LinkedIn. It's not the same, but an Instagram DM you can just talk to people directly. Like, and I have talked to so many famous people or people that I need for my work, and I just like just send a message, and you'd be surprised that they actually reply. 
makes uh, what, what, I mean, it helps obviously, I guess in that sense, what you do for a living and having already built a personal brand helps you when you start approaching them at this phase, right? Like, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it's different, but just make sure when you're going in, like, what's the ask? Yeah. What's the value you're trying to add? Like, don't go in just to, for the sake of like, you know, talking to them. Like, do you have an ask? Do you have something of value? And is there an action? And, and part of that action thing is like, is there an email where can I, and you give your email first so that you know you're not being creepy asking for theirs. Like, I would like, if you could just email me the right person on your team to talk to, I'd be happy to talk to them about it offline. Okay, well, we ran out of time, but I'm just going to take a couple more questions because there are so many. Um, Maha, I'm so happy to finally see you talk and I've thoroughly enjoyed this session. What do you do when you're not feeling it or feeling demotivated? I've some minor experience with personal branding from way back in the day and got quite a following on Twitter, but it got exhausting. How do you deal with this and still be consistent? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm human. <laughs> I have days where I'm like, I'm not doing it. I'm not writing this weekend. And the, the ones that I did weekends, like when I decided I'm not going to be writing, I, I like I read. I'm like making sure I'm doing something just to add value to myself and to learn. So like I don't, I cut myself some slack and I don't put a lot of pressure on myself because then it makes me hate doing what I love. So just the days that you don't feel like doing it, just don't do it and do something else. <laughs> Um, thank you for your time. Again, inspirational. One of the best personal branding talks I attended. Thanks, Maha. Um, someone said, uh, Bucky Nam, I do fear that my current employer and agency would feel threatened about my exploration outside of my work into growing my personal portfolio. Any thoughts on that? That's such a good point. So, so make sure that what you're, this is such a good question. I'm glad we, I, I was just reading in some of the comments too. Somebody, somebody else had asked it. So, so how do you start building your personal profile without your employer thinking, oh, they have other priorities or other things that they care about. And now they're not focusing on my job. They're doing their side hustle more than they're doing their business. Well, make sure a couple things. One, that it doesn't compete with other, whatever your job is, because that's not, you can't do that. Like that's not right. Um, so if you have a competing business that you want to create, then you need to leave your job and go do that. You can't do it while you're at your job. Secondly is making sure. So this is a really good example of like, um, you're at your job and you started to create a t-shirt or a hoodie line and you want to start selling those, you know, you know, making sure that you're saying this is a personal initiative and you're like, I, most employers would and should applaud people that want to have interests outside of work. Um, but, uh, if you feel I, every company's different, so I can't say like, just go tell your boss, you're going to start doing this side hustle thing. Like that, that doesn't work for everybody. It doesn't matter if they're with, if the employer's not enlightened about it or they don't care about it, but just make sure that you're not doing it in a way that makes them feel that it's taking away from your company's time or your main mission or focus of why they're paying you. So don't be doing, you know, things during office hours that, you know, like if you're going to have a, a jewelry, you make, you make your own jewelry and you decide to spend the afternoon, you know, you know, doing a free bazaar, like during working hours, you either take the time off and do it or like just be smart about how you do it in the time that you do it because it is public. It is out in the open. Um, it is out there for people to see. So just make sure that they know that, you know, is it related to your business and it's helping you increase your profile for that company? Is it not related to the business? Then you should be doing it on your free time. Makes sense. Is there a risk of creating bad perception of using your professional status to enhance your personal brand when using your LinkedIn profile? So... That's a, that's a tricky one. You you, you kind of can't do that. Like you kind of, you, you can't really, unless it's part of your job to do that, you really shouldn't be doing that. Um, like I said, most employers would love the fact that you are giving guitar lessons on the weekends or you're passionate about, you know, teaching people how to do yoga or whatever your interest at a work. It's pretty common now, like having a side hustle and having something that you're passionate about outside of work is something that's pretty common. Running a business is a different story. Like if you're running a business outside of your business, then and it's really a big, you know, thing with, you know, employees and other operate. That's a different story. But depending on what situation you're in with with where you're at with your personal brand. Okay. Well, um, there's one more question about whether or not uh, or how to monetize a podcast. Have you monetized um, Savvy Talks Digital? No. 
I, I don't, I, that, my, I don't make any money off my podcast. The whole intent was to give away information for free. So if you guys can go listen, you'll see it's all just tips and tricks and things that I did. And then one season I did a bunch of interviews with people. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about like, especially after COVID and what's happening now, like influencers and how they use your platforms. Like your platform should be of purpose and of value. That's your personal brand. There to hawk products and get paid to peddle products to people. It's not really a sustainable personal brand. So I want to thank you so much for your time. It's unfortunately we didn't get a chance to go through all of the questions, but um, I mean there are so many of them and very little time. But I must say the feedback overall is just that this has been an awesome session. So thank you so much for being here with us today, for sharing your value, sharing your time, for walking the talk, and for all these amazing tips on personal branding. And um, I'll be emailing everyone the resources and we'll get in touch after the webinar. Thank you.